to see in 1946, mm -hmm. uh, not long after the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, and I joined, uh, if this is not well, in anticipation of some of the questions, yeah. I joined a, a little ship called the Wombat. The Wombat? The, yeah. the Wombat, yes. Mm -hmm. And the Wombat uh, was part of, during the war years, the American uh, Army Small Ships Fleet. Originally, it was a probably one of the earlier self-propelled suction cutter dredges which was owned and operated by the then Devonport Marine Board and when it was fairly obvious in the United States of America during the Roosevelt uh, administration in 1940 that America would in all probability soon be in the war. Mm. The army sent some of its uh, sort of water specialists out here to mm. look to see what sort of ships might be available that can be converted given that the war was going to be for most of the period through islands, some yeah. large, some small, yeah. like New Guinea for instance, mm. uh, they needed to have ships that could offload from larger ships with munitions and military equipment yeah. Yeah. Uh, to run them up the coast of New Guinea, through the Solomon's Islands and wherever else the war might take them. And, uh, the Wombat was such a ship. Wombat was one, yeah. Yeah. Um, so how old would you have been then? Sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah. And uh, you stayed on her for what, any length of time? I was on that ship for about uh, five months. Oh, yeah. uh, I actually paid off on compo, I just forget for the moment, but I had a series of headaches and uh, uh, at the time, the doctor, uh, you know, said I wasn't I wasn't to uh, work for a number of days, and the ship was sailing in the meantime. So I uh, paid off uh, on compo. The agents of the ship were a pretty dodgy transport company called F. H. Stevens. Oh yeah. <laughs> and there was a rogue of a bloke, Mr. Davies, who was the general manager was an elder of the church, which I learnt subsequently mm. uh, when I was talking to him, trying to negotiate a union coverage for ships like the mm. Wangala. Oh, that's how I... And mm. uh, uh, the company didn't want to pay me compensation, mm. so I went to the union office and I saw the then vigilance officer officials in Melbourne were Bill Bird, who was the secretary and uh, the vigilance officer as the uh, later assistant secretary was known as was a bloke named uh, Jinx O'Brien and uh, he got onto the company and they soon paid me combo. Yeah, right. So it was, uh, it was a good lesson in uh, what the union is about. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. was able to achieve. Yeah. 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 Huh? And it was also a good lesson in, uh, you know, the idea of become familiar with what your rights are. Mm. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, what made you choose a seagoing career, Roger? Well, I had a brother, uh, I say had because he subsequently died down in the Antarctic. But I had a brother, Ken, who was four years my senior, so uh, he went to sea in probably late 41, early 42. And uh, he'd come home every now and again and 
talk about uh, you know uh, convoys and being chased by submarines mm. and mm. things like that. And uh, but I got the impression that it wasn't a bad uh, life. It sounded uh, interesting. Uh, so uh, I put my name down and subsequently went away to sea uh, just after the war. Mm. What, uh, after the Wombat, what were uh, some of the other ships? That you well, the next to? ship I was in as uh, deck boy was a ship called the River Murchison. Uh, they had been built by the Australian uh, Shipping Board, which was an organisation set up during the Second World War to organise the ships uh, for the war effort. Uh, that didn't mean, of course, that private shipping companies that were the main operators of Australian shipping up until the ASB came into operation. Didn't mean in any way that they didn't, uh, uh, you know, run their ships, so to speak. But the shipping board decided what were the priorities, so yeah. which, which ship would carry what and yeah. to which theatre of the war would they go. Uh, subsequently, the ASB uh, during the war started to build more ships. Uh, as in the First World War, uh, the British needed their ships more for the European uh, theatre of the war and the Middle East and it was necessary just as it was during the uh, latter part of the First World War when Billy uh, Hughes as Prime Minister set up the first uh, Commonwealth shipping line. Yeah. Uh, it was necessary for the government of the day during the Second World War to start uh, building ships and uh, the river boats were probably uh, all up dead weight full of cargo. They were probably been close to 10,000 ton, maybe yeah, right. a bit, bit smaller. And they built a series of these uh, vessels which uh, subsequently uh, after the war, the ASB continued for a period and then it was reconstituted uh, probably in the early period of the Menzies long period of government uh, was reorganised, reconstituted into the Australian National Line. What, uh, what were the conditions like then as a deck boy? Well, I thought at the time uh, probably influenced by the romanticism that seems to stimulate our young minds uh, when we want to go away to sea. Uh, I thought the conditions were good, but then when I think in retrospect of the subsequent changes that took place over a fairly long period, that the conditions were fairly primitive. The first ship I was in, the Wombat, there were six of us in a folks probably about the size of this uh, uh, office that we're sitting in. Mm. Uh, there were three sets of double tier bunks, two of thought chips across the forehead bulkhead, the other two down the sides. And uh, on the after bulkhead there was a series of lockers, one for each person. Behind that there was a little cross alleyway, a mess room and a galley. And uh, above that there was the officers accommodation and in this particular ship, as it carried no uh, steward, I was in fact signed on as deck boy steward. Oh, right. And my job in the morning was to uh, clean the officer's accommodation every day. Mm. And when I say clean it, I mean clean it. You have to uh, scrub the uh, teak decks every morning. There were no uh, deck coverings mm. in those days, no line oiling or 
no lino tiles or uh, carpets yeah. or what have you, which yeah. came later. And uh, the ship carried uh, a skipper, a mate, and he had to have a radio ticket uh, so that he could uh, send uh, use wireless telegraphy. And I might say as an aside, the uh, mate was a guy named Ron Deeds and he was one of the finest uh, mates that I ever mm. came across in my experience. And I don't want to indicate in any way that uh, there are not many, many uh, good mates and good skippers. There were a few that were very much in the English tradition of uh, strict class hierarchy, but most of the mates and skippers that I came into contact with were pretty good. I suspect that one's relationship was uh, with them was assisted by the fact that I uh, took my work very seriously. And once I became, at about age 18, more interested and more involved in the union, uh, which I did as a result of encouragement from a lot of older seamen. Uh, I started from the premise that when I knock on the skipper's door on behalf of the crew, the skipper needs to realise that he's talking to somebody who he regards as a competent seaman. Yep. Not, yep. you know, some windbag who's pissed all the time and, uh, you know, when you're talking about chipping and scraping, uh, wants to uh, do some other job mm -hmm. or not do the job very well. But I remember that particular mate uh, uh, very clearly just sort of sticks in my yeah, uh, yeah. sticks in my mind but I I uh, catered to uh, the officers kept their accommodation clean waited on the saloon table and then uh, after I'd helped the cook after lunch uh, strap up the galley uh, well then uh, I'd go out on deck and work with uh, the seamen to learn to be uh, yeah. the seamen. Yeah. yeah, so on the uh, on the river boat... The river boat was a big uh, big change. Yeah, it was going to ask, yeah. Especially in terms of the accommodation, uh, I uh, became acquainted with a two-berth cabin. The, uh, there were two deck boys in the ship. It was a big ship and uh, most ships uh, probably over a couple of thousand tonnes. Uh, when I was at, uh, first at sea, carried two neck boys. They nearly all carried an ordinary seaman. And this, this was uh, very advantageous from a in long-term industry point of view because it was actually providing training for uh, younger seamen to replace the older ones. Uh, uh, when, if they were lucky, they retired on the old age mm. pension. Yeah. But uh, we had a two-berth cabin, we had our own laundry facilities, and we had our own shower and toilet, and I thought, wow, you know, <laughs> this yeah. is yeah. really it. But uh, on that ship, the deck boys had to look after, uh, uh, and as you probably know, and, and uh, or both of you know that uh, the structure of uh, Australian shipping for a long time after the war very much reflected that we'd imbibed the British shipping tradition. So uh, I used to, uh, along with the other deck boy, you'd do a week about looking after the petty officers. That was the bosun, the carpenter and the document. Uh, most of the ships, about 6,000 tonne and larger, carried a shipwright and uh, this ship carried a shipwright so we had to clean their cabins, clean their mess room and uh, make sure their pantry was 
yeah. uh, stopped and uh, weight on the table, take their meals to them and uh, again in the afternoon you'd go out on deck and start learning to be a seaman. The following week you'd spend the whole week on deck. Yeah. But, uh, and the rest of the crew, they were three in a row. The bosun had his own, the petty officers had a single berth cabin. The rest of the crew were uh, three in a room. Uh, some of the river boats, the accommodation was aft. And uh, in the river Murchison, as with a number of the other river boats, we were all accommodated midships on the main deck. Oh, right. I, that and, and that's a good part of the ship to be mm. in because it's the, yeah. it's where the less movement is so you get a smoother ride. That must have been amongst the first to uh, not be in the forecastle, would it? With, with the, with the, oh, the yeah, yes, yes. And uh, I was in uh, uh, another ship which uh, had a forecastle when I was ordinary seaman. I uh, was in a ship called the Tambar which, uh, uh, just as a matter of interest, was one of the ships used by the late Captain John Williams, who came to uh, serious world prominence when he salvaged the gold bullion that uh, uh, went down with the Niagara when it went uh, sunk just off New Zealand. Uh, he had the tan bar along with uh, several other ships uh, as one of his little fleet of salvage mm, uh, right. ships but uh, I was in the Tamba. Uh, she had a forecastle right up forward. Uh, the greasers and the document were accommodated amidships mm. uh, in some of the old passenger accommodation in its early uh, period. Uh, oh, right. uh, Tambo was one of those small passenger ships they used to run to Warrnambool, to King Island, to Flinders Island mm. and places like that and carried it, oh, maybe a dozen passengers. Mm. So uh, when she got converted, uh, uh, you know, got some improvements in the accommodation, the uh, greasers went uh, midships uh, next to the bunkers, I think they yeah. were. <laughs> And we were the ABs were forward, and immediately abaft the forecastle, where there were yeah six of us again in that ship. There was a little mess room and a scullery with a hot press and uh, so on. And uh, but I, uh, you know, I thought it was a good little ship. We, used to do some interesting work. There were a lot of old time seamen in yeah. Hollyman, so it was possible to learn a lot about wire and mm. rope and the general work uh, of uh, seamanship. An interesting feature of the Tambo was that if we didn't have twilight labour, uh, wharfies, well then uh, Hollyman's used to tie up between uh, number five and uh, number 11 South Wharf and that was called Hollyman's Wharf because their ships utilised those berths and there might be half a dozen of Hollyman ships in on any one night depending on their schedules if you could call them schedules uh, and there was one night watchman and if there was no twilight labour the generators and the power was turned off and we used to have a ker kerosene lamp on the gangway and a yeah. kerosene lamp in the forecastle, in the saloon and so on. Yeah, right. So conditions were, uh, by modern standards, very primitive, but that was how it was. So uh, I didn't think uh, badly of it. In fact, uh, I have to say that my Recollections of life at sea are, in the main, only good memories. Mm. I loved the time I spent at sea. I regarded the work, uh, in retrospect, I think I regarded it like a game because, as both of you know, uh, on 
many ships one day you can be painting the funnel the next day the weather's not suitable so you're up forward splicing wire always there was something interesting to do and I suppose what I really liked about it is you were always going from one place to another and you were get, getting paid for it. Yeah. Whereas people who went overseas on passenger ships were paying hundreds of pounds in those days for the pleasure. What, uh, what sort of time would you have been in port? How long would it take to load? Uh, Australian uh, stevedoring uh, facilities and methods were very primitive uh, so that uh, and to give an example for instance before the bulk loading and discharge of uh, sugar uh, sugar was carried around the coast in or 70 or 100 pound bags and down at Yarraville this sugar was uh, unloaded uh, slings of sugar bags, maybe 20 or 30 bags in a sling. It was landed on the wharf and then the wharfies on the wharf loaded it onto small tramway dollies and there was a tramway pulled by draft horses mm. that used to take the sugar into the sugar works and then they'd uh, lift the bags up, put them on a platform Tip, slip the bags, tip the raw sugar into uh, the machinery for refining and mm. doing whatever they were going to do with the sugar and uh, that's what conditions were like yeah. all, all around the coast and there's no doubt about it that it was partly the war but more the early post-war years which saw some improvement uh, of the highways, mm. some improvement in the, the rail system that actually brought about the need to improve Australian shipping. But right up to the end of the war years, the ship owners had it all their own way in some of it. I mean, for instance, I was on uh, uh, a ship uh, the Kulana and another ship, Kulana belonged to the Melbourne Steamship Company and uh, I was on a ship of Hutter Parkers, a ship called the Goulburn in the Tasman Melbourne Tasmanian trade and another ship uh, owned by uh, Union Steamship Company, the Coronui which was a prize ship from the First World War. Now these ships were you know, nearly 50 years old and yeah. antiquated gear and uh, uh, and the equipment on the shore side on the wharf was primitive so it required a large number of people to load and discharge, yeah. to discharge and load a ship. It required fairly big crews to uh, uh, work, uh, work the ship and work the gear and t uh, maintain the gear but say compared with the Scandinavians the ships were very primitive. Mm. I was on one ship that it was so slow that coming around there's a bit of a set between Kangaroo Island and Port Adelaide and uh, yeah. What's that peninsula in the centre, yeah. the Cape York Peninsula? Yeah. Yeah. And I was in a ship called the Old Dinga, which was an old, uh, oh, I don't know, 40 year old ship that belongs to the Adelaide Company. And when we were coming through the backstairs passage between uh, uh, Kangaroo Island and the uh, mainland, the ship was so bloody slow that you could throw a, a line over the side with a hook and a bit of wood on it and we'd catch, a, a, oh, what do you call it, they've got very sharp teeth, the barracuda, oh, right, yeah. and we'd take it along to the cook and we'd have fresh fish for <laughs> breakfast, yeah. otherwise it was frozen fish. Yeah. But we had a wonderful chief steward there by the name of uh, George... Uh, 
forget his name, but he was an ex-Navy steward and he was a terrific bloke and even though it was Adelaide Company and they were tight mm. on the purse, uh, he'd do everything possible within the limits that he had to uh, provide the best food he could. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and he became an activist in the uh, steward union uh, right up to the time of his death. He died a number of years ago, mm. but he was, he was a bloke that will stick in my mind that a Stu Chief Stewart, who wasn't on the main <laughs> side, made the budget line his pocket. He was a, but a genuine a, steward. Yeah. You and far between. Yeah, but, and uh, they were. F uh, they were, and I, I don't want to malign them in any way, right. but they were poorly paid, mm. uh, and like Chief Stewards in most ships, they thought, well, how can I make up my pay? But that sort of leads on pretty well to. Yeah. Some of the other characters that you've met over here. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story about uh, the uh, Triaster, uh, one of the uh, uh, rather large for the period. The Triaster and the Trialis loaded with 12,500 tonnes dead weight. And by any standards, bef before containerisation and the advent of the super tanker and uh, you know a hundred odd thousand ton bulk carriers a twelve and a half thousand ton ship was big mm. and uh, anyhow captain colin evans was uh, skipper of the uh, triaster and uh, he had the unfortunate experience like a number of others of being uh, attacked on the drift uh, by uh, Japanese raiders and he ended up in a Japanese prison camp and I suppose the interesting thing is that people who were in prison camps it's amazing how well take that weary Dunlop you know he, he emerged from the war uh, I'm not religious but almost like a saint in that uh, he wasn't bitter about the experience. He did the best he could in the worst possible conditions, but he set out to encourage the maintenance of world peace and mm. tried to develop good relations, including with the enemy who had incarcerated he and his comrades. Uh, so it's interesting the effect that uh, being in a prison camp can have on individuals psychologically uh, and I remember the skipper of uh, the Tri Enza, the first phosphate ship that had an Australian crew and I was one of that crew and there was a skipper then by the name of Eddie Simmons and he came originally from Wales and he was just such a wonderful uh, person and he, he worked overtime to make this new crew mm. satisfy the phosphate commission that they'd made the right decision. Mm. Whereas Colin, Colin Evans, and I don't wish to malign him in any way and I don't know whether he's still dead or alive and whether he'll see this uh, uh, video subsequently but he was, uh, he seemed to be psychologically a very difficult character, very much in the mould of the British merchant marine class condition. And he'd sent around, uh, you know, the orders of the day telling all the uh, officers to, uh, you know, they'd pass the Tropic of Capricorn, get out your tropical whites. Mm. And he was dissatisfied with the performance of the deck crew. He thought they were a bit slovenly. And bear in mind that the two big tri-boats were actually passenger cargo, uh, passenger cargo vessels. They transported the staff from the British Phosphate Commission from the Ruin Ocean Island going on leave in New Zealand or Australia 
most of their kids went to private schools on the uh, either in Australia or New Zealand, so they transported the kids backwards and forwards and so on. So the captain, uh, well, Captain uh, Evans, he uh, thought that, well, you know, I've ordered the officers to break out their tropical gear and uh, I think the crew should smarten up a bit. So he sent down a memo uh, ordering people to be uh, cleaner and tidier around the deck and put clean jeans on when they turn to and clean t-shirts mm -hmm. and so on. So uh, Lenny Harroyd, Topsail Len, as he's known to some, and I suspect that he got that name because he spent many years in the old Tasmanian catch fleet. But Len was a bit of a wag, as you two guys know, and uh, so Len decided he'd doby all his gear and, you know, respond to the captain's <laughs> memo. So, anyhow, You'll both know uh, uh, that it's often the case that the master of a ship will go up in the latter part of the four to eight watch, talk to, the, is it it's usually the second mate, isn't it, or is it the uh, mate? Chief mate. So, yeah, and see the mate and say, well, how's things going, uh, Mr. Mate? Uh, you know, what's our position and what's the weather report? And, and generally have a talk about the day's work and the travel. And anyhow, he uh, did that, and uh, I forget who told me, but the guy that was the wheel part might have been Gus Guthrie, and I'll tell you a story about him in a minute. But whoever was on the wheel, uh, they said, uh, all of a sudden, uh, Captain Evans said to the mate, he said, what's that, what's that? And he was looking through the... Uh, wheelhouse windows and he saw some sort of movement up the mast or in the, uh, the stays and so he said get the oldest lamp so the mate shone the old they went out on the wing of the bridge and shone the oldest lamp and there's Len up there with nothing on but a uh, lap lap or a lava lava and he's swinging around in the rigging so you know the captain orders him below and called him up to the bridge party the next morning. He said, well, uh, I'm going to log you, uh, Seaman Howroyd, and he read out the log to him, and he said, well, what have you got to say in your defence? You realise you've got an opportunity to put your case? He said, well, Captain, he said, you sent down that memo about clean gear, and I put all my gear in the washing machine and only had this lap lap. So... Uh, that was Len, mm. but uh, another character uh, is uh, Gus Guthrie, who's, uh, or the late Gus Guthrie, who's known uh, to the two of you, and uh, Gus took a job in the Harbour Trust for a short while. He, I don't know whether it was marriage or a girlfriend or what, but he took this job in the Harbour Trust. And in fact, it was, I was already an official of the union by that time. And I don't know how, but Gus managed to inveigle himself into harbour control. And anyhow, he's on duty one night and uh, his colleagues down having a piss or something. So he, uh, he rang harbour control and he said, Hello, is that at the, the harbour control? This is Luigi Longo here. I am the chief officer of the Achille Laurel. We're not sailing tonight. Cancel tugs. He said, Captain having big party. <laughs> so the tugs were cancelled and the crews were sent home. Yeah. And uh, this might have even been the days before they had taxis to run around and pick them up if they lived out of town a bit and there were no car allowances and so on. So, uh, you know, it comes uh, midnight for sailing and uh, the pilots looking around and the captain, hey Luigi, where, where are the tugs? Where are the tugs? He said, I got a phone call from tug control saying tugs, tugs cancelled, you've got big party. 
So, uh, Gus, uh, on another occasion, he uh, uh, rang up Claude's poodle parlour in Turak Road, Turak, <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, is that Claude's poodle parlour? And the bloke said, oh yes, what is it you want, my dear? And he said, well, I'm the chief officer of the Triallis. And he said, a friend of mine uh, and a colleague up in Nauru, the family wants two of your best pedigreed toy poodles. Oh, yes, yes, I'll have them ready. And he said, how will I get them? He said, well, you bring them down, deliver them tomorrow. And of course, uh, the mate knows nothing of this. Yeah, and uh, yeah. the following day, this bloody bloke uh, gets down to... Uh, uh, the ship and uh, oh, he asked the guy in the gang, we see somebody at the gangway and he said, where can I find the chief officer? And he goes up to the chief officer's cabin and knocks on the door. Oh, I'm from Claude's poodle parlour. I'm Claude. Here's the puppies you ordered. So uh, he used to get up to uh, a lot of those capers. And There's a famous story showing around about Gus. Oh, Gus. Gus was... Uh, Including the German uniform. <laughs> yes, he, yeah, he, uh, there was a period when uh, uh, he was sort of active in the RSL and uh, he used to play the cornet in uh, their band and he'd organise people to go to the uh, Anzac Day Parade and that sort of thing. But uh, I think uh, the RSL got a bit thick of him because he got an old German uniform, a uh, helmet and a coat and swastikas and so on. But yeah, this was Gus. He was a, a practical joker. For sure. And uh, he really pulled off some good ones. <laughs> Just getting back to the other horrible little bastard who was skipper on the trias. So yeah. I think he is dead. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But he was a mongrel right up until the day we yeah. handed the ship over to yeah. the Nauruans. Mm. He uh, logged and flogged Freddie Watson and, uh, yeah. and Johnny Taylor mm. for going ashore to look for a bloke who he sent him ashore to look for. Yeah. He was yeah. a horrible yeah. No, he was... Uh, but I suppose uh, my comment and interest in people like that is that it's to say no more than interesting how some people can go through the most terrible adversity yeah. and come out of it a wonderful human being and others go through it and you know they're looking over their shoulder all the time and I'm not blaming them one can't it's it's impossible really to make a judgment yeah. on yeah how people will react, but it's interesting how adversity makes some people stronger and makes them fight harder yeah. for the things they believe in, and others, they almost give up. Norm Shirley yeah. went through the same prison camp. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah sure. Well, uh, Paddy, uh, Paddy Green, Paddy Green. Green. Yeah. Uh, he went through... Uh, Similar experiences, and yeah, I've met uh, uh, people who were in uh, uh, picked up by uh, sunk and picked up by German raiders, and ones in Japan, and some of them have come out terrific people, yeah. and others, you think, gee, you know, it must have been bad for you, but you know, why don't you get your act together and get over it? But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting comment or observation on how human beings uh, react to different yeah. situations. Yeah. 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 You know, on, on that try, so when Evans went off, there was like a complete change in the officers and everything like when George Kitchen came there as well. Ah, George was. Yeah. Uh, and he was mate yeah. on the trialis when I was there and I, I liked George and I remember one day we were in uh, Auckland in New Zealand and when I was gearman, I used to wander around the deck all the time uh, and if the wharfies had uh, shifted the derrick and left the uh, uh, tail of the uh, guys on the deck, I'd 
you always make them up and see that everything was uh, ship -shot. And he said to me, he said, what are you doing that for, Roger? And I said, well, I'm doing it because you don't have to chase after me and ask me to do it. And they said, if you know I'm doing my work and I've got a complaint, you'll treat me seriously. And he said, oh, I said, yeah, that's right. But he was a good mate. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, not a bad skipper. Yeah. 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 So uh, you, you moved on to become a union official. When, when did that happen? Well, perhaps if we just go back a bit and yeah. I, I make this observation that when I was a youngster, my father died as a result of uh, being gassed on the Western Front in the First World War in 1937 with serious bronchial problems. Mm. And that put our family in an entirely different situation. Mm. So we went, uh, our, uh, our, my late mother, my brother and I, we went to live uh, with our grandparents. They were able to accommodate us. And I had a very unusual grandfather who was in many respects racist. Uh, he was anti-Semitic and uh, a very odd character, but he'd travelled a fair bit. He'd been in the Boer War, the First mm. World War, before the Boer War, he'd worked in Fiji and the sugar plantations, the banana plantations, and he'd travelled a bit. And he, he was a reader. And what he said to my brother and I, and I'll never forget this, and have always valued it since he said, look, read everything you can get your hands on and mm -hmm. then you can be able to make an informed opinion about matters. So I uh, took that to heart, my brother did and all he ever read was the uh, uh, Reader's Digest which uh, <laughs> was well known in the, in the post-war years for its anti-communism and uh, support for the CIA and uh, reactionary American presidents. But I read and uh, I think by the time I was 18 or 19 I would read most of the uh, prominent writers uh, from America, from the left like uh, Hemingway and John Dos Passos, and I'd read most of Jack London, uh, who of course uh, came from the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, I'd read, uh, I'd read quite considerably, and how this came about, apart from my grandfather's encouragement, was I met a number of seamen whom I. Uh, come to know as members of the Communist Party uh, and in particular I remember two blokes. One was Frank Smith who uh, some people called him Deffy because he had a hearing problem and hearing aids weren't anywhere near anything like they are now, nowhere near as sophisticated. But he was a communist and uh, he, uh, we'd go ashore a lot together and he'd discuss the news with me and what was in the paper and suggested, look, why don't you read this book? This is very interesting, it's about this. And then there was another guy, uh, Eric Simkovich, who was uh, an old Russian who I think may have had to leave Russia after the 1905 revolution came to Australia and subsequently ended up as a seaman. And I found these people uh, very cultured, and when I say cultured I mean in the sense of very educated. They knew a lot about art and culture and literature, uh, and they were able to convey this to their shipmates in uh, an easy to understand style. So. Uh, I became acquainted with quite a lot of uh, 
communist and uh, you know by the time I was uh, 18 I actually joined the communist party uh, after a uh, demonstration in support of the then dockers and painters officials uh, Jim Donegan and uh, Doc Doyle they had uh, been arraigned before the uh, magistrates courts for giving out leaflets announcing a, a, a rally, mm. peace rally or something. Mm. And in those days you were supposed to apply to the Lord Mayor for permission and of course we never applied for the permission, yeah. we just did it. And eventually of course that broke that law. Mm. A bit like Jim Cairn says, if a law is wrong, oppose it and defy it. And that's what we did. But uh, and I got asked to join the Communist Party and I joined and uh, subsequently uh, in 1959 I was elected uh, Bill Bird, who was the Victorian Secretary from the early 1940s to uh, 1959, decided to discontinue at sea, uh, to discontinue in the union office and uh, in fact go back to sea. Mm. So uh, what the uh, national, the federal office of the union wanted to do uh, when Elliot was still alive and secretary, they wanted to appoint the officials and uh, some of us prevailed upon them to run an election because we thought that was that would set the new officials off on a better uh, a better start, so to speak, than yeah. if we were just uh, appointed by the committee of management. And in the event, uh, Elliot and his colleagues agreed with that, and mm. an election was run, and Bert Nolan was. Uh, elected secretary, uh, I was elected what was then vigilance officer which subsequently became uh, assistant secretary so uh, I'd had a, I think a long apprenticeship uh, for example uh, when I was in the Warringah uh, along with Jim Steele who uh, subsequently became an official and was uh, on the Karoon, we were both on the Melbourne Hobart run, uh, one ship one week, one the other, and we were in uh, Hobart during uh, the, uh, what became known as the Hersey Dispute. Uh, you probably uh, have heard about that dispute, it was a dispute about uh, the branch deciding, uh, the Wharfies branch deciding on a levy to help the Labor Party in the uh, forthcoming uh, election at that time. And uh, Santa Maria uh, and the National Civic Council were able to encourage uh, three Wharfies, uh, uh, Dennis Hersey, Frank Hersey, the, the father, and a guy named Coltrane, I can't think of his uh, given name, but they were uh, active uh, uh, in the Catholic Church, and I don't want this to be taken as uh, an attack on the Catholic Church as such, because there are there is a very prominent movement today uh, known as uh, the Catholics for Social Justice, which is led by the Jesuits, who my observation is that you would probably title them the progressive wing of the Catholic Church in today's historical conditions. And just as an aside, the Jesuits fought with the Sandinista against the fascist dictatorship in Nicaragua, fought with guns in their hands. Now if a Jesuit is prepared to do that, or to march down the street with me carrying a placard, ban the bomb, or 
something of that nature, something to do with the social conditions under which we live, that's good enough for me. Mm. And even though I have, have no religious beliefs and indeed philosophically am opposed to religion, uh, I have no objection to people having religious beliefs and more than that, having a right to practice their religion and I only hope that if I ever have to face uh, some situation because I'm not religious that they'll support my rights, but that <laughs> remains to be seen. Yeah. However, <laughs> uh, uh, however, uh, these people were active in the Catholic Church and it's, a, it's an historically established fact that depending on the nature of the particular congregation, the particular priest in that uh, Catholic community, it was often the case that they distributed the news weekly and had Santa Maria speakers to whip up the, uh, the community if there was a communist threat around the next corner or if there was an election pending and indeed through the Democratic Labor Party, they kept uh, Labor out of office for at least 25 of the 27 years that Menzies was in office. Now, having uh, said all that, uh, I was active in the uh, dispute, uh, helping uh, organise the seamen, uh, and Taz Bull, uh, Leo Lanane, and a number of others were uh, leading that struggle and we organised uh, the seamen and it was interesting that uh, I remember one night we were painting up slogans uh, against the Herseys about the dispute and the coppers pulled us up and they said well uh, you know maybe, maybe you better get back to the ship they didn't try to arrest us or anything and they uh, you know said as they were leaving look don't think we enjoy this Ursy dispute, mm. we don't, but you know, we have to tell you you're not supposed to paint, <laughs> paint the walls and so on. So I had that sort of experience. The union was running a campaign to try and expand the Australian uh, national line, which uh, had, in fact, it was already even when Menzies was still Prime Minister, or it might have been after Menzies left when Gordon or Holt was Prime Minister, they put the first ship into the Japan trade. Mm. Uh, and the idea, of course, was to have a window into the conference system, but we know from our own experience that that was highly abused, that the ANL ships only ca often carried only empty containers and of course it was impossible without the will of the government mm. to bust the conference system and have a fair dinkum free trade arrangements with the various countries we were trading with. So that, but I used to uh, see the wharf is delegate in Sydney or Brisbane or Adelaide or wherever and say look at Smoko can we address your wharfies and we'd run a meeting about ships crew would come off and we'd run a meeting about the ANL get a, get a resolution to the government or the ACTU the opposition about the uh, need to expand the Australian national line and to defend it so I suppose those sorts of activities and organising small peace demonstrations, helping to organise the seamen into the May Day marches in Hobart and so on, these things I think constituted uh, my apprenticeship so to yeah. speak and so I think I was partly equipped Mm. to take up that new position as a, a vigilance officer in 1959 and uh, uh, some of you uh, know uh, a bit about my history since then. Yeah. But, uh, what was your last ship before you come ashore? 
the trialis. Trialis. I was going to ask you, the, uh, did you make the comparison of the, like the changes from going to sea to going into the office? Or? Oh, well, well, the, the main comparison, and I don't wish to uh, seem uh, uh, unnecessarily critical, but when we went into the union office, uh, this was long before the uh, aggregate salary or aggregate wage concept <coughs> came to be applied uh, across the industry in the late 60s uh, and, and more widely in the early 70s, but I got about uh, half the pay as an official than what I got at sea. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd been bosun in a number of ships, and uh, uh, but uh, and but the pay in the phosphate ships uh, was pretty good. Uh, you know, if you were a day worker, well, you could always work a bit of overtime if you wanted. You could do that if you were a watchkeeper. They were big ships. They required a lot of painting and cleaning and upkeep. So that the money by by 59, I suppose we'd, you know, we'd overcome that serious dispute of 1959 up to 1962 when uh, Justice Foster in 55 had awarded quite extraordinary conditions into the award, uh, like uh, at that time we were still on monthly rates of pay, so you got paid as on a 30-day month basis, 12 months of the year, so you got that pay. If you uh, worked overtime, you got paid and you also accrued a portion of leave, so in a sense you were getting paid three times for the one day. Mm. And I think that in retrospect, aside from the fact that the, in, that the then uh, uh, Arbitration Commission was sort of moving to a more conservative uh, centre or even moving a bit to the right, I think that the main reason that we lost those conditions is that we didn't actively seek with the other unions for those unions to establish those conditions for themselves. So that in a sense we're out on a limb. Yeah. Uh, and therefore it was easy for Foster to move against it because nobody had gone and knocked on the door and mounted a case, well, you know, the seamen have got this, so we, why shouldn't we have it? Uh, and regrettably, uh, we didn't uh, encourage those developments. Now, that may be partly a hangover from the Second World War years, and I make this point simply because it's, I think, interesting. And I should un uh, also say that only two weeks ago I finished rereading the uh, present, al already published, History of the Seaman Junior, uh, prepared by uh, Brian, the late Brian Fitzpatrick and uh, What's the other guy's yeah, name? Uh, Carl. Uh, Carl, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, who's uh, uh, an historian. And during the war, mainly on the initiative of uh, Elliot and the Siemens Union, because the, particularly after Curtin was elected Prime Minister, and having a Labor background himself and being uh, 
an ex cane cutter, uh, an official in the old days before the big timber workers strike in 1929 on the eve of the depression, from which they never recovered until they joined the CFMEU a couple of years ago. He understood that if the war was to be prosecuted effectively, you had to have the trade union movement on side. So they set up what was called the Maritime Industry Commission. And it meant that the unions were able to use their influence with particularly with the government bureaucrats and with the ship owners because the war situation, in my opinion, was advantageous to the union movement because the seamen had been smashed in 1935, the wharfies in 1929, 28, the timber workers, so many of them had been really savaged in uh, the Depression years. And whilst there was the beginning of a comeback, uh, earlier initiated by the miners, where the, miners, the communists and the left of the Labor, the socialists whom they had some influence with, had been visiting the minefields, getting the miners organised back into their lodges, as they called their union groups. And the seamen were doing likewise. We saw the breakthrough with Elliot first getting elected in Brisbane and then in Sydney and uh, subsequently Bill Bird being elected and uh, a number of other communists. The period of the war with the, uh, and with the iron workers and the building trades uh, in the engineering union saw uh, a set of conditions which lent themselves to the union to rebuilding mm. and making their mark so that the Siemens Union utilised those conditions to advance the interests of all seagoing workers. So the Guild, the Institute, the Cooks, the Stewards, they all came into it. Well then after the war it sort of fizzled out. The Guild and the Institute, uh, you know, they, they felt, well, it's a totally different situation. We're back, we're permanent employees of the company, let's see how that goes. Uh, I think probably the stewards, the cooks and the Siemens Union fell out a bit because they had uh, different approaches to trade unions, how, how to conduct the union. Uh, what sort of demands to have and uh, I think uh, in those days the stewards and the cooks would have found it difficult because they weren't even Labor Party oriented. They were strictly looking at the union and doing what they could uh, and uh, so that their officials were fairly conservative the Seaman Union was uh, growing in terms of the left influence in the Union, uh, growing in the sense of uh, uh, supporting the peace movement, uh, being against the bomb, and all of these things, and seeking to use post-war labour in office to improve the lot of seafarers. And uh, so I think that that partly led to uh, everybody going their own way, so to speak. So that by the time this 1955 award came along, our union was in a relatively good position. The others were, I suppose, the best I could offer is that they were still meandering, not quite sure where they wanted to go. They hadn't developed, at least as we had in em embryo, with the campaigning for, uh, you know, a genuine national shipping line, competing with the conference and so on. They didn't have 
such policies. In fact, they almost had no policies at all, uh, except the cooks had a policy. The chief cook has to get extra overtime every day after so many days at sea because he has to bake bread. And it's the sole reason that the chief cook was the highest paid person on a ship before the aggregate salary. Mm. The highest paid person, you know, more than the skipper. The bloke yeah. who has the responsibility, the safety of the crew, the ship, in his hands. And often, they even got less than the bosun. Mm. Uh, so that, you know, they were sort of drifting along without real policies. We were developing, uh, for those years, fairly uh, detailed and sometimes quite sophisticated. Yeah. social and political policies and because the others hadn't come in behind and you know in a sense didn't really encourage them uh, and often when we did encourage them didn't receive much of a response because when I became an official I thought one of the things I want to finish this job on is the basis of working better with the other unions, getting them involved, getting them into negotiations for the offshore uh, of the pipelines and that sort of thing. And I might say at the risk of it being immodest, I think I actually achieved a fair bit of that. But when I first became an official, I'd ring up uh, Bluey Baines, the secretary of the Cookshin, who was another character. Bluey used to run, his office was above uh, the Waterside Hotel. And if you wanted to get away to a sea, to sea as a cook, you'd frequent the SP bookie and put a few bets on and of course, Bluey would get to know you, and at Christmas time he was always short of bloody cooks. Yeah. And he'd say, oh, look, there's a spud barber's job on the old dinghy. Would you like it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, have another bet, have another, oh, yeah, two dollars on so-and-so. And, you know, then that cook would go away. There might be a change of articles in Mackay while the ship was chain uh, loading sugar. And the second cook would pay off a change of articles and the chief cook or the chief steward would say to this spud barber who can hardly peel spuds, <laughs> yeah. do you want the second cook's job? And that's how they got trained. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd say to Bluey, look, come down to the ship. Or I'd say to Purse the punter, who was, who was the, which was the nickname of the uh, honorary secretary of the Merchant Service Guild, come down to the ship with us. Oh, no, Roger, look, tell me what it's about. I'll ring the captain. I'll tell him you're coming down and you can handle it. But slowly but surely, uh, at least in Melbourne, and I know in other ports, uh, but particularly in Melbourne, we used to have regular meetings. Uh, and in fact, when Craig Cook, you might remember Craig, he was... Uh, industrial officer for the Merchant Service Guild when they were in the P&O building. Uh, no, before Craig Cook, Roger Hardley, who ended up as a steward, but Roger was uh, industrial officer there, and he took an initiative, and as a result of that initiative, we used to meet at least once every six weeks, We'd simply swap information about what the Siemens Union's pressing at the moment and what the Guild's concerns are. And it was like a clearinghouse to assist each other to deal with problems in a way where it was a win-win situation for yeah. everybody. And. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story about these meetings and uh, I uh, now do a lot of work with, uh, oh God, what's his name, uh, Ralph McDonnell, yeah. who, was, who ended up Commodore Skipper 
of uh, the ANL in the passenger cargo ships, and uh, he uh, was uh, Ralph was secretary of the uh, he was an he was on the National Council of the Guild, and he was also chairperson of the local Victorian branch of the Guild. So in that sense, he was active in the Merchant Service Guild, and he came to a meeting, and uh, uh, I didn't think that, I'd forgotten that some captains can be a bit formal at times, and uh, I said, uh, uh, Captain, and then I called him Ralph, and he went back to the ship, and. Uh, the delegates rang me the next time the ship was in port and he said, oh, Roger, he said, we've got a complaint from Captain Ralph McDonnell. I said, what's the problem? He said he called us up to the bridge the other day when we were here and he said, that official of yours, Roger Wilson, the Assistant Secretary, he said, I was at a meeting with him at the Guild office and he called me Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> and now I work with him on the Pollywood side and we're, you know, we're in, involved in negotiating with this company and that company to, but... But it's, it's a classic example of what you were saying. Yeah, before, it's, the, uh, it's the interesting, class but yeah. I, I have to say in fairness and in defence of Ralph, whom I regard uh, as... Uh, a very uh, good person. Mm. Uh, he's got a wonderful interest in history. He's written a history of the old Commonwealth mm. line. He's also written a history of the salvage ships uh, around the Australian coast during the Second World War. He's got a really good interest in shipping and history. And on the Polly Wood side, there's no beg your pardons, I'm a foreign going master with the, you know, foreign going master certificates. If the bilges need cleaning, mm. who's, who's doing it? Ralph. Mm. Uh, if the wooden deck needs uh, corking, he's in the gang that's doing it. So mm. he's, uh, and I might say that any time Often seamen would come in, a delegate would come in and uh, uh, maybe this is a point where I'll tell you another funny story about characters, but a delegate had come in with a bloke and he'd say, well, oh, you know, fucking Ralph McDonnell, he's logged this bloke. And I said, what is he logging for? Nothing. Hasn't done anything wrong. And I'd say, all right, well, you want me to come down to the ship and you want to have a talk with the captain in my presence and you want me to talk to him. Okay. Okay, well, I'll be down at such and such a time. Let the captain know. We'd go down and Ralph would listen to what you had to say and listen to what I had to say. And he'd lean over and he'd say, but Mr. Wilson, Roger, did they show you the log entry? Log entry? It's the first <laughs> I've heard about a log entry. <laughs> so, so just a moment, he'd go and get the log and he'd say, uh, seaman so-and-so, number so-and-so on the articles, drunk and asleep on lookout, you know, on a passenger ship. And I'd say, look at the delicates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, well, tell me that. So, uh, then, you know, well, I'd tell them to, uh, Let's get out of here and thanks for your time, Captain. And then I'll just tell them to eat humble pie. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I've, I've never known him to log anybody or warn anybody unless they deserved it. And I'll just tell you two other funny stories about characters. There's a bloke that shipped out of Sydney and he was on the. What was that little. It was a Caltex tanker, one of the Sydney, early... Sydney, Kembla, Manchester, Liverpool? Caltex, Manchester, Kembla. I think. Anyhow, Bill Thorpe was on it. He ships out of Sydney. Bit of a, bit of a bad egg, you know. He'd get pissed. He'd 
get bad temper and put people on the knuckle. Uh, but the trouble is that seamen don't often report those uh, misdemeanours, otherwise such people would buy me in here and get a spell ashore, but uh, be that as it may. He rang me up and I said, well, come in and see me, and he came into the pickup, I think, half pissed, and I said, what's the problem, Bill? He said, oh, I said, we've got a problem with this gangway, you know, this fucking new skipper out of British ships, wouldn't know shit from clay, and I said, now, you sure about that? Wouldn't know shit from clay? And he said, yeah, he doesn't know anything. <coughs> and that was Cam Watson, who uh, I later found, uh, after the experience, found him to be uh, a most helpful person if there was any problems on the ship. He'd give you his advice and expertise. A first class bloke. And that's what most seamen tell me. So we go down and uh, carry out an inspection and the arbitration commission's there and the reporter taking it all down. And so it comes my turn and I pipe up and I said, oh, well, uh, Captain, uh, the delegates tell me that uh, you're new on the coast and uh, you don't have any experience about these types of ships. He said, well, uh, Mr. Wilson, he said, uh, Mr. Commissioner, and so on. He said, like... Mr. Wilson, like Roger, I went to sea as a deck boy and I studied and I eventually got my f chief mate's ticket and he said I signed up with the Shell Oil Company and until I joined this company a couple of weeks ago, I've spent the last 15 years in Shell Tankers trading all over the world. So I felt, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we resolved whatever the problem was the gangway was, but oh Jesus, I, I yeah. felt, uh, not only did I feel <laughs> like shrinking, but I felt, you know, really angry with this delegate that, you know, hadn't taken the, the time in the couple of weeks the skipper had been on board the ship. To find out. If I was the delegate, but I would have gone up, whether, if I was a watchkeeper, I'd engage him in conversation when he came up after he talked to the mate. I'd say, oh, Captain, could I ask you about your experience, yeah, what yeah, you've yeah, done? Yeah. So that, you know, we yeah. know about the you. The background. Yeah. 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 Uh, and you can ask me about my background. Yeah. But not a thought of that. And, uh, you know, these are the silly sort of things that they do. But. Just a funny story about the pilot service. The pilot service, as you know, used to be operated from the Wyuna, and the uh, station was on the Wyuna just outside the heads. <coughs> so I got two different phone calls, one from a bloke named Laurie Howard. I don't know, your dad would have known Laurie, so when you're talking to him, ask him if he yeah. remembers Laurie. I think he died of lung cancer. He used to smoke uh, very heavily. And he rang up and this other bloke, uh, oh Christ, Keith Patton. He's got a brother, Bruce, who yeah. was bosun in the Melbourne trader when yeah. he came out from Norway. And both of them, they're, they're guys that you know, if they smiled, their face would crack. And, uh, uh, I hope that if they see this video, they'll appreciate that I knew them as uh, serious and of a dour yeah. demeanour, so yeah. to speak. <coughs> so they didn't smile a lot. So anyhow, I arranged to see Bruce and uh, I said, look, you're coming up to Melbourne on there. You've been in the pilot service? Not down here. No. Uh, well, they, they have a bus that shuttles the Melbourne home porters backwards and forwards, uh, Queenscliff. Yeah. Although a lot of the crew lived down around the Ballerine Peninsula, but a lot of them still lived in Melbourne in those days. So Keith comes in and uh, 
he sat down and I said, uh, after asking about his family and how his kids were doing at school and so on, I thought, you know, this might make him feel better. But I used to do that as a, I just thought it was you know, a good, good policy, really, to make people feel you uh, had an interest uh, other than their wages and conditions, so to speak. So we go through all that, and I said, now, what's the problem, Bruce? You rang and we're here, now tell me, and I'll take down the details and see what we can do about it. He said, oh, he said, it's the fucking scallops. And I said, scallops? <laughs> this was a game before the average salary. And I couldn't afford scallops. I said, scallops? He said, yeah, he said, we're getting them twice, three times a week. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, what? I said, do you know how much scallops are in the market? And I told him what they were and I said, I can't afford them. He said, no, never mind about the market. You can't afford scallops. You know, scallops three times a week. And I said, what do you want three times a week? He said, oh, a crayfish. <laughs> and I said, but it's not in season. You know, they were prepared to eat frozen crayfish instead yeah. of fresh scallops. And I thought, Christ, you've really got some problems. Yeah. And then this other guy, Laurie Howard, came in. And after going through the routine about his family and his kids and his health and so on, I said, What's, what's wrong, Laurie? And he said, oh, Roger, he said, it's shocking. I said, what's shocking? He said, those pigs upstairs, he used the old Navy uh, expression, he said they got triple tissue toilet paper. <laughs> and I said, so? <laughs> well, so, so what? He said, well, when they wipe their ass, it doesn't make their piles bleed. He said, we got that rough, cheap, cheap stuff from the just-in-time supermarket. <laughs> so, you know, these guys had a week on and a week off, three weeks annual leave, transport to and from Melbourne, if you're a Melbourne home porter. And don't misunderstand me, I mean, I was elected and paid to deal with their problems. But yeah. frankly, I didn't consider these, these problems yeah. particularly important. So I simply said, well, look, I'll talk to the pilots. And I said, well, see you later, have a nice week <laughs> off. But, oh, you know, some of the bloody things that... Yeah. Uh, yeah. people come up with and I think actually in one sense after the sort of after the dispute over the 1959-1960 award was overcome and we've reached agreement about the stabilisation system the a shipping office, running the pickup under government rules <coughs> with the assistance of the ship owners rep and the union rep, the establishment of long service leave, the establishment of the retirement fund, that actually coincided with the renewal of a lot of the shipping in the Australian shipping yeah. industry, it coincided with the introduction of the ANL was the main pioneer in the roll-off, roll-off field. They were very innovative. They did it long before the international container system, but compared with other ship owners, perhaps with the exception of Hollymans with the William Hollyman, uh, Union Steamship Company with the Seaway King and the Seaway Queen and Union Bolt Chips as it later became with the, uh, the second Coringa. Yeah. Other than that, 
much of the much of the shipping still remained old hat. But after these few innovations with the bass trader, the empress, the black widows, uh, and then the BHP started to grow much bigger than just a steel company. So they made some very good innovations. Uh, with, they moved their bulk carriers to the Iron Whale and was it the Iron Spencer? Yeah. To about 12,500 tonnes. Then they moved to uh, bigger ships, about 50,000 yeah. tonnes. Uh, the Hunter Bars, and yeah. uh, so on. And all these uh, things led to the ship owners and indeed the general manager of Union Bolt Ships, after they built the Karinga and introduced a plan, the Kanimbra and the Manura, he actually had a front page spread in the uh, financial review to which I used to contribute because it always had some interesting industry information in it. And he had this article which, and I won't bore you with the details, but the uh, theory is that the uh, bigger the cost, the more modern, the more automated a particular production process is, you can utilise smaller and smaller amounts of paid labour, i.e. workers, and the part of the overall investment for the 10 or the 20 or 30 years for which you're investing the $10 million, just say as a case in point, the smaller becomes the labour component. So that what he was arguing is that if the crews are smaller, well then better conditions can be easily afforded. Yeah. And the best time to do it is when the ship is built. Mm -hmm. So that that again, like the war years, it created circumstances in a sense by chance. You know, the ship owners weren't doing this because they necessarily wanted to give us better conditions, uh, but they certainly wanted the labour component of their investment over time yeah. to be smaller than in uh, uh, like an old fashioned iron boat, you know, where there were 15 or 16 on deck. Uh, and for the union, it was an opportunity by using their own arguments in part and using other arguments of their own as well and using a bit of persuasive pressure from time to time through the utilisation of action on ships to persuade the accommodation committee which was a subcommittee of the Marine Council which is a committee determining whether a person is fit to go to sea or not, well, it allowed the unions, from the skipper to the deck boy, so to speak, to gradually improve the accommodations, whereby uh, a union demand of the uh, early 70s that there be uh, equal or more or less uh, equivalent accommodation for all from the skipper to the deck boy, well, those conditions were achieved through that period because it was a period when the fleet was being renewed, new tankers were being renewed because the other ones were going to be sold or go back to Britain or wherever they come from. It was an opportunity for the union and it was taken to become more active in organisations like the International Labour Organisation, the International Transport Federation, which we heard a report from the Wharfies uh, rep this morning, uh, 
from such other uh, international bodies and working with other unions overseas, it allowed big improvements to be made internationally on minimum standards, which has helped immeasurably the struggle against flags of convenience. It allowed these new conditions part of the development of capitalism and a union response to those developments for first class living conditions to be established on board ship for everybody from the skipper to the deck boy and that's how it should be but it took a long time to achieve that you two uh, are aware of uh, what this all meant because uh, you lived through part of the period. My experience tells me that I had went to sea at the best time for seamen worldwide in that most of us emerge from the Second World War still pretty primitive, but making some good gains, particularly as the Allied forces won the war against fascism. Uh, we took Churchill, Curtin, Roosevelt's utterances that things have to be better for the ordinary people, the workers, not like the Depression, we took all that seriously, we took hold of it, and organised labour achieved some quite outstanding improvements, not just in Australia, but particularly in the other traditional seafaring nations like the Scandinavian countries, West Germany, France, Italy, and so on. So that it's been, for me, uh, a fantastic experience. Mm. Uh, I'll always have good memories of my life at sea. Yeah. Uh, I met so many fine people, uh, people who, like myself, hope that we could change the world and make it better. We now know, of course, that in this period, the period where we're facing a, a major and important federal election, we know that it's with the stroke of a pen, so to speak. And not just so to speak, because the stroke of a pen in the ballot box because it's all now determined by what happens in half a dozen, a dozen marginal seats at most, who becomes government. Because we don't have the system that most European countries got, a proportional representation. If a party gets a minimum of 10% of the votes, it gets representation, and so do those 10% of the people that voted for it. The first past the post, the system we've got, it is only, in my view, partially democratic, but it's the system we've got. So for anybody that sees this video before the elections, while well, I urge them to put their shoulder to the wheel, as was said this morning, and work hard to defeat this government. And that's the only chance we've got to reverse Australian Thatcherism. And even that, if Labor is uh, successful, which I certainly hope it will be, nevertheless, we will have to put much pressure on the incoming government to turn this what, 10 years now of mm. disastrous attacks on labour in particular, the community in a broader sense, we will rue the day if uh, 
the Conservatives are successful, so work hard for the defeat of the Howard government. So, yeah, yeah, uh, no, no question what you're saying there. Um, what, uh, what do you want to uh, add any, any more? Well, the, yeah, there's one thing. You, you uh, skirted over the issue of disputes and that with the Hersey dispute and that. Yeah. I think uh, a pretty uh, serious dispute we had in the uh, mid-60s, or from the start of the 60s right through until I think it was 72, if my memory serves me correct, when God put them, got elected, was the Vietnam War. Matter of fact, I think that's where I first met you, Roger, yeah. when uh, you helped me evade uh, conscription. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the, I should have uh, mentioned the Vietnam War and in the sense that you're interviewing me along with a whole lot of other comrades and colleagues, uh, mainly retired seafarers, uh, I was very involved in uh, the struggle against the Vietnam War, as was the Union as a whole, and of course it, they are now uh, historical facts that uh, the Union got involved in what became known as the Boonaroo dispute. Uh, we know that subsequently the ACTU called a meeting and regrettably uh, the Siemens Union I think at the time, with the support of the Wharfies, were the only two that voted against the proposal that the ship be permitted to travel to Vietnam, notwithstanding that it was supplying, taking uh, bombs as well as uh, non uh, equipment of which you might argue at a stretch was non-military, like barbed wire and. Uh, uh, humpies to store the munitions in and uh, or for a new toilet or something like that. So the, that I was at that meeting and uh, to say no more than it was disappointing but the union uh, didn't give up but uh, kept struggling. That cr particular crew which uh, in my memory uh, uh, I can remember Don Ferguson uh, was in the crew, uh, the late young Jeff Swain was yeah. in the crew. I'm not sure whether Bobby Smith was there or whether he was in uh, in one of those Black Widows at that time. But uh, what to say, the crew's attitude, uh, I went down, Bert was actually on holidays at the time, and I, they rang me up at home about six o'clock and I went down, had a bit of breakfast with them and then had a meeting and they said, well, we're not taking this ship to uh, Point Wilson to the uh, powder grounds because we've been advised that it's going to load, among other things, uh, military bombs and so on for Vietnam. And I said, well, OK, I'll uh, convey that to the federal office and we'll take it from there. In the event we... Uh, Got uh, oh, it was the he was uh, what year was that? Uh, it was just before Whitlam was elected, yeah, wasn't it? Would it? Have been, uh, uh, might have been the year before, but whatever year it was, uh, we got Frank. His son was head of the Labor Party for a while before Frank. Uh, Korea, yeah, Korea, Korea. Yeah. who I think was Shadow Treasurer. Then he came down to the ship and had a talk with them and he undertook to convey their views to Whitlam and, you know, the Shadow Cabinet and so on. And I've got no doubt that he did that. Frank wasn't a bad sort of a guy. And uh, I, he was quite friendly with me, even though as a communist candidate I'd often opposed him in uh, federal mm. elections. But he was always friendly and welcoming. Anyhow, that led to the crew not taking the ship to Vietnam. It put a lot more pressure on the Union. But I think the government 
probably failed to act uh, simply because some of the other civilian organisations did crew it. Mm. Uh, nevertheless, it's to the credit of all of those seamen who refused to crew the ship and all of the union officials and peace movement supporters, uh, other unions, and you, we know that subsequent to that, the uh, Waterside Workers' Federation put a ban on the Japarit, which was also in the uh, Vietnam trade. Uh, my own involvement in the war against Vietnam, uh, I uh, helped to organise uh, a port stoppage in uh, Melbourne on the day of the first moratorium, uh, all of the uh, the whole port stopped. They all assembled at the then uh, Wharfies Pickup in uh, Pickett Street, which is now part of the uh, new uh, uh, modernisation of the Victoria Dock area. We marched up uh, from there uh, along. Uh, Spencer Street and up Burke Street and uh, the policeman in charge uh, kept on asking me, look, can you uh, hold them for a minute? The others have jammed up Parliament House and can you do this and can you do that? And the policeman was asking me in a sense to be, do what his officers couldn't do, uh, get some attention and see that we proceeded in an orderly way. And I've got, uh, had no objection to that because I was on the organising committee of the moratorium and I'd done things like go on a deputation at midnight to the age after a meeting of the Vietnam moratorium committee and at that stage the age used to <coughs> get its newsprint from Hobart. I just said very quietly uh, after somebody else had spoken because the age wasn't reporting the moratorium and it, it was a big movement. Uh, you know, the biggest stoppage, the biggest demonstration. Hundred odd thousand bucks. Yeah, well, yeah, it's been estimated as many as two hundred thousand. Whatever, it jammed the streets from Parliament House right down to Queen Street when we all sat down and Jim Cairns read out a list of all those young Australians who'd lost their life in Vietnam and that was very sobering in the sense of the mood of the demonstration. But we had offered the police our cooperation, they were cooperative. It might be argued there wasn't much they could do anyhow, but I'm saying in fairness to the police they were they accepted our offer of uh, making the demonstration peaceful because after all we were demonstrating for peace, not war. Uh, on another occasion uh, during this struggle and uh, uh, what's his first name? Wayne. 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 Wayne, yeah, Wayne, I'm sorry. Wayne, That's all right, Roger. Wayne, Wayne reminded me that uh, I helped him disappear for a period during his resistance. I, uh, and I might say, uh, just for the record, I never told my uh, any of my colleagues that I was up to this caper because uh, some of them might argue that you're putting us in a difficult situation, but I moved uh, quite a number of drafts of resistors around this coast always in consultation with the crew. I'd go down and have a meeting with the crew and say, look, we've got this guy who doesn't want to be conscripted. He's prepared to fight it. He's willing to go to jail. Can you take him to Townsville or can you take him to New Zealand or wherever? And I might say that uh, all of uh, the ship's crews I asked, they uh, Help. That doesn't mean that everybody in the crew necessarily supported that, you know. Some generally, uh, well, they might have had a son. I, I remember at one, it's the same, part of the same 
sequence of events. They, uh, what happened in, uh, I gave out leaflets opposing draft resistance. And that meant that you're actually, as Jim Cairn says, break the law if you think it's wrong. And that was breaking the law mm. when they were going in to register. Mm. So we got arrested and subsequently there was a court hearing and uh, I just got up in the court and says, uh, said, I'm not going to pay and you can send me to jail or you can do what you want. But in the event somebody paid the fines and uh, that we weren't uh, locked up, but the proceedings were in the magistrate's court. And I don't know whether you've been to the magistrate's court, but there's a quite a big courtyard and passageways, and you can jam a couple of hundred people in there. So some were demonstrating outside, some inside, and all the ships at Western Port Bay walked off, hired a bus, and they came up to Melbourne, and then uh, so. I knew that it was important to keep the people there all day. So every now and again I'd uh, you know, give a bit of a talk about what had happened. I'd go inside and listen, tell them what's happened to so and so. Some poor old stiff, you know, he went to sleep in the park and he's getting four days jail, you, you know, all this sort of stuff. <coughs> Anyhow, every now and again the magistrate would send a message out with the uh, one of the coppers and he'd say, would you ask Mr. Wilson if he could tell them to quieten down a bit? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was a, a sort of a good feeling, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. they're asking us to. Yeah, yeah. And when I, when we came back after lunch, they would moved the court and tried to block it off so we couldn't get in. So we all rushed down there and I said, quick, get down there. They got in. But what the copper in charge, and he had all this silver braid, he said, good on you. And I said, uh, well, thanks very much. And he said, I've got a son who's his marble or might be in the barrel yeah. next time. And, you know, so it made me think, well, you know, uh, here's a policeman and all of these other people that have come here to demonstrate, and we've all actually, we've got something in common. Yeah. He's worried about his son's future. He doesn't want him to go to Vietnam. Mm. So he thought what we were doing was terrific, but you know, he sort of indicated, well, look, I, I'm here on duty. Yeah. Oh, I can't really carry a placard. But I thought, well, you need to take those things into account occasionally. Uh, uh, you know, it's like we were talking about uh, the Hersey dispute before with Catholics who supported the DLP, the National Civic Council, and Catholics who didn't. To me, one of the things life has taught me is that you have to differentiate given the issue that you're trying to tackle. If you're on board a ship, there might be something that you can tackle, and I often said this to delegates, they'd bring in a repair list if the ship was going into dry dock and, and there'd be things on the repair list too, which I knew would be of concern to the engineers or the cooks or the stewards. And I'd say, have you raised these with the cooks and the stewards? And then, oh, what? Uh, but try to encourage them to do that. And it's, he, see, one bloke said to me once, Oh, Jesus, the union called for unity at its last conference and the captain logged so-and-so. And I said, what did he get logged for? Oh, he said he pissed off from the lookout. And yeah. I said, that's not what unity is about. Yeah, yeah. The mate's got a job to perform on the ship. The captain has. So have you. What's about unity is how can we expand Australian shipping, including the Australian National Line and the private companies, so that we're a proper player? Yeah. How can we get them to battle for a salary increase the same as we're battling for? How can we get better food? How can we get the cooks sent off to school to have proper training? Yeah. 
you know, so you have to differentiate. Yeah. And I think this union, particularly I've noticed it, and I only say this because I'm more acquainted with the Victorian branch because I live in Melbourne, but I think there's a recognition now by the Labor movement is that regardless of the outcome of the elections, the comeback, as it were, for the union movement, because there are a lesser number of unions now that have been able to withstand the assault from Howard than there were previously, it seems to me that there's beginning to be an understanding that we have to reach out to the broader community. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Fran and I were in Italy some years ago, in fact, 27 years ago now, and I had a letter, or we had a letter from the Communist Party, an introduction to communist and socialist parties, so we could go and knock on their door and look them up get a picture of what's happening in Germany, Spain, or whatever. And we had a letter. She was in the ACOA, which was the uh, Administrative and Clerical Officers Association, the top public service body. And I had a, union, a letter from Garrity introducing us to the union movement overseas. And we went in to, we went to Genoa, and we walked around, and there were, you know, big posters like this, and it was time to renegotiate all of the collective agreements for workers in Genoa and for the maritime transport sector, the public transport and so on. So we saw all these lists, and the top of the list was increased childcare facilities, public transport, and more schools. And 13th and 14th on the list were wage demands. Mm. Yeah. And I said to this, uh, uh, Daniani was his name, and I said, look, comrade, I said, you know, is this for real? Mm. I said, or is this just a, you know, a sort of a way to mm. get your way? He said, Comrade Wilson, he said, I can tell you, he said, that's how we operate here. Mm. When we close the factory door or walk down the gangway as a stevedore or a wharfie, docker as they call them, we don't take our hat off and put another hat on and then say, oh, now I'm no longer a docker, I'm just a married bloke going home to the family. He said, Workers in Italy treat their work and community as one and the same thing. And a worker who's going home from work is no less a union member simply because he's going home. And that was a real eye-opener for me uh, to the extent that while I continued to work for the Siemens Union, Every time the committee of management would meet, I'd usually write a, a four or five page submission. I'd take up the things that I thought were uh, urgent for the union to what were the main things to address at that moment, whether it be wages or shipping line campaign or whatever. And I'd always raise other issues which were either of concern to the broader maritime transport community and where appropriate to the broader community. And that seems to be the way that some of the unions, including this union, are now focusing. And I believe, particularly if uh, the government is defeated, that the election of a Labor government will make the space, 
that's necessary for the unions to reconsolidate their position and go forward. And if that happens, well then the next decade should be a bit better for mm. Australia. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. Just harking back to uh, Vietnam, one of the blokes we've interviewed, uh, Roger, was the uh, he was a lieutenant commander in the Royal, uh, the Navy Reserve, yes, uh, XAB, and an A and L skipper, uh, John Quinn. And I interviewed oh, him. Uh, sorry, I, him. I interviewed yeah. John probably five, four months ago, three months ago, something like that. And he said, to his everlasting shame, he agreed to take the Vietnam, uh, the Japara to Vietnam. He said he wished now he had never have done it. Well, well, I think yeah. that's interesting in a, in itself. And I can only say I commend the fact that he's come to that conclusion. However, if you think about a more current situation and transpose that, as it were, to Vietnam, in the early period, uh, after... Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh had defeated the French mm. well and truly mm. and one should remind the viewers and the listeners of this final tape that the French had actually guaranteed independence to, Viet, to the Viet Minh and to Ho Chi Minh because it was they who had held down numerous divisions of Japanese troops who could have otherwise been used in the desired attempted invasion of Australia mm -hmm. because the French VC forces supported the Japanese just as they did in the south eastern part of France supported the Nazis and put the finger on people of the the Jewish uh, background and sent them off to the bloody gas ovens so that you know there's no doubt and Eisenhower in his memoirs is I haven't got the actual quote here but he's reported as saying something like if there were a free vote tomorrow remember they put in that temporary parallel as they did in Korea oh, yeah which was the cause of the war in yeah. Korea, he said that he thought that something like 86 or some, you know, close to 100, not much less than 10% of the people would have voted for Ho Chi Minh. And they would have done that because it was the Viet Minh guerrilla army that fought against the Japanese occupation and then fought to get rid of the French who promised them independence and then went back on it with the support of the Americans. As I, as I read, yeah. it was actually the British yeah. who first went in. Yeah, and then they made it easy for the French well, to bring they, their troops. In fact, they transported them. They rearmed the, the Japanese and That's rearmed right. the Viet Minh. That's right, yeah. yeah. So that they actually rearmed the Japanese mm. until the French got there yeah. mm. and then they took them home. And they did the same in Indonesia mm. to try and put down the uh, revolution in Indonesia in favour of re-establishing Dutch colonialism. Yeah. So, you know, and it's like in, uh, in Malaya, the victory march in London was led by Chin Peng, who was a Chinese Malay, mm. a member of the Chinese uh, Communist underground. He actually led the fight against the Japanese. Mm. And it's in fact the Malayan princes now who have got him to thank for their independence from yeah. Britain, not the British. Anyhow, I was going to uh, say about this uh, captain, if you take the war in Iraq. You know, initially, especially following the events of September the 11th, when uh, the two planes crashed into the World Trade Center, well, it's not difficult to understand, one, the dismay, two, the horror, and three, then, support for Bush 
to go in there even though the evidence before and the evidence since mm. is that Iraq was not supporting Al-Qaeda in yeah. any way whatsoever. It had no weapons of mass destruction and it didn't have uh, an atomic program. But you remember when Bush Senior went in, he didn't really win either. Mm. And we've got a bloody nose. It's a bit like payback. And in fact, the evidence now is that the backroom people in the White House had been planning this war for a number of years. Yeah. And if you look at things like uh, secularism uh, versus, say, a church-run state, a religious-run state, it was only one of the few Arab countries where women can go to university. So that, you know, they attacked a country, yes, with a monstrous dictator, but in terms of the Arab world, one of the more open countries than, you know, the, the country that supports bin Laden the most, his yeah. own country, no, sure. Saudi Arabia, yeah. the Egyptians, the Syrians, yeah. you know. I mean, it's a joke, but this captain, obviously, like some of those Americans, he probably felt at the time, oh, you know, the bloody seaman union, Jesus, they fucked it up again, and uh, whatever. I don't know what was in his mind, but I'm not surprised, given the passage of time, and given all the things we now know, not only about the Vietnam War, but about the war in Iraq, yeah. is it any wonder that most of the people in America, most of the people in Australia, people in Britain, the yeah. new Prime Minister's moving to gradually get out, the Italians have pulled out, others are going to pull out, the Germans are going to pull out, the Koreans are pulling some of their troops out of uh, Afghanistan. Yeah, what happened with John? He was ex SUA, he went back yeah. for him, but yeah. he was a uh, naval reserve and they yeah. re brought his commission yeah, of back course, in. Of yeah. course, of course. Oh, no. Well, that's what naval yeah. reserve's about, isn't yeah. it? In different circumstances, you know, like the Second World War, well, yeah. you'd say, well, shit, we're fighting the fascists. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You'd put your hand up. Well, after I got out of the Navy, I applied for the Naval Reserve and they, they, they wouldn't have me. <laughs> uh, you're, you're too, re yeah. you're too re cool centrist. Yeah. 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 Um, just, uh, as you just said then about uh, now being retired, when, when did you uh, actually retire from? I actually retired from full-time paid work. Uh, I, at, I went on compo with a bad RSI, stress-related condition in the arms and the neck and the back and so on, in <coughs> September 1992, and the compo, you know, they sent me to this one and that one, but I was on compo for the maximum time, uh, then I went off compo, uh, I lived I was a kept man for a short period and then my superannuation, the little bit I had in the seafarers retirement fund, some superannuation I had from when I worked for Bunner Walsh in the second Kane government between 85 and uh, 89 and then from 89 to 92 I worked first as the industrial officer, then as the secretary industrial officer of the aviation branch of the firefighters union. So I've been retired, I suppose, uh, in the sense of not being paid since late 94. You're an SUA official until when? 84, uh, from 90, from July 59 to September 1984. And as you also said, bad being retired, 
now active in the maritime Well, I'm, I'm uh, for the viewers and the listeners, uh, I've got uh, still a fairly active life. Uh, I'm tonight, for well, today, for example, I've been to the uh, monthly meeting of the retired maritime workers, uh, in which I play uh, an active part. In this evening, I'll be attending the Kensington Association, which is the uh, uh, public community group which agitates for the residents of Kensington, particularly to the Melbourne City Council. We're in a community of, I don't know, about six or seven thousand people with the new housing developments in Kensington and we've got over 200 members in the community organisation. So it's quite active. I uh, play a fairly active part in the uh, Melbourne Maritime Museum, uh, more particularly in the uh, maintenance of uh, the uh, uh, Bark Pollywood side. Um, I'm sort of associated with the crew that does all the repair and maintenance work. Uh, I'm on the ship's committee of that uh, group which meets once a month to advise the National Trust about you know what what needs to be done with the ship etc etc. Uh, I've uh, written a uh, paper which is uh, now under discussion through the Pollywood side newsletter uh, trying to develop a, a young people's recruitment program because as uh, Wayne and John you both know that the skills that we learned because container ships are so different are fast disappearing. So what I'm trying to do is develop a youth training program which is aimed at places like the Sea Scouts, the Sea Cadets, uh, some of the secondary schools. We're hoping to have some talks with the Melbourne Port Authority because they've got a youth program, adopt the ship. Mm. And when that ship comes to Melbourne, a group of young people go down there and see if they can help the crew with any of their mm. social activity. If the Melbourne Harbour Trust or the Port Authority can do it, so can we. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, in addition to that, I mind sometimes friends' dogs one or two days a week. I walk in my son's dog, I go to a gym and generally keep myself fit mm. and interested. Yeah, good. And we go to the movies a bit because there are a lot of good movies where you can see that problems like we're having, people in other countries mm. are having them and uh, it's interesting to see how they're dealt with in case there's a clue there as to how we might mm. tackle some problem here. But yeah, generally I'm uh, keeping fairly active. That's no, good, good to hear. I suppose my only, not regret, but I occasionally have a desire to make one last voyage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, we'll yeah. see about that. You did one out to Falkland there a couple of months oh, oh, ago. Oh, uh, yeah, well, that's to, uh, that was to put birds ashes. Put farewell birds. Yeah, yeah. About it. Uh, it, it's nearly two years. Two years ago? Yeah, September, September two years two ago years. he died, yes. Yeah. But, haven't seen that yeah, one, yes. I'll, I've got no oh, doubt, I'll, but, Bert Fagan. Yeah, yeah cool. but that's part of the reason why we're yeah. doing this. Yeah. It was one of the spurs. Yeah, to, sure. Uh, no, he's, uh, he was a, a good bloke. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes a bit straight laced. Oh, but a good, uh, good comrade. Yeah. Uh, that's that's terrific. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that.
If you think of anything else, well, don't hesitate. If you can think of anything else, don't hesitate. Do oh, sure. Yeah, I know. But I, yeah, I know. It's it's not easy to. No, that's right. No, no that's uh, right. And what I might do is I'm I'm uh, presently I, I gave a, a talk at a seminar a couple of years ago. And, it was organised by <coughs> the Labor History Society and the oh, something socialist. Uh, Bernard Shaw was the founder of this. Oh, oh the Fabian. Fabian, yeah. Yeah, the Fabian Society. And they put two, three or four of us. The question was, with the benefit of hindsight, would you have still joined the Communist Party? Mm -hmm. And so what I had to do was, in 20 minutes, half an hour, traverse my whole life. Now, I'll, I'm will i actually, at the moment, typing that onto a disc. Mm -hmm. So, do you have, you have burning facilities, yeah. don't you? Yeah. When I've finished it, if I give it to you, yeah, you can make a copy, yeah. and then you oh, right. you can yeah, two of you see it, play yeah. it, mm. and if there's anything in there, you can f feel free to. Terrific. Oh, be, right, yeah, right. because see, I've got things in there about Asia and how mm. this. Oh yeah. When Hawke decided to have this commission uh, into Asia uh, under Judge. Uh, Anyhow, the judge finally recommended that ASIO didn't have enough powers and bloody Hawke gave them all the powers. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. But I had to go to their headquarters, which in those days was in sort of Kilda Road, <laughs> next to the army barracks. And the farce I had to go through to see this bloke, mm -hmm. if you play the tape, you'll see it. And if, if you think that's worth recording, <laughs>